Hello booktube, thank you so much for watching. My name is Nathan and welcome to my channel and I guess more directly, hello Steve Donahue. So I am participating in the Has Steve Reddit tag. So Matthew at Mayberry Book Club, he came up with this idea of looking at books on his shelves and then asking him the question, uh, has Steve Donahue read this? Because it certainly can feel for most of us mortals when we look at our book collection and we think, have I read anything? Have I read anything that Steve Donahue has not read? And certainly if you go incredibly niche and you say, okay, he wouldn't have read something in this particular field, just when you think you're safe, then he'll just confidently dash all of your optimism that perhaps you've read one thing he hasn't actually read, and he'll just say, well, of course I've read that. And then he gives you this long history on the book. I've seen other people participate in this, and it's a bit daunting. Now, what I'm doing is I'm trying to put my own spin on this. So I am doing a Canadian literature version of this, and I'm genuinely curious. I'm doing this because I am genuinely curious how well read Steve Donahue is in Canadian lit. Now, a little bit about why I came to, to this uh, decision. So for one thing, in case you cannot tell, I am Canadian, but I no longer live in Canada. I'm currently living in Florida. I've been here for about a year and a half or so. And if you uh, know anything about Canadians, then there's a, a funny little idea that we have, which is the most patriotic Canadians are the ones who no longer live in Canada. And that does seem to be true because I was not the most patriotic can Canadian in Canada. Um, in fact, I'm pretty sure that the lowest grade I ever received in a literature course was in Canadian lit. So if, <laughs> if I have read it, then surely the great and powerful Steve Donahue has read it. But here's the funny thing about Canadian literature. I'm not sure how well it travels across borders. British lit uh, certainly travels well, and a lot of European literature. Beyond that, however, Canadian lit kind of gets overlooked, at least that's my impression, and I want to test Steve. I really want to know, because with some of these, and I've got a few books on my list that are fairly recently published and are bestsellers in Canada, and I want to know, did he even get a copy? Did anyone forward him one? Because a lot of these books just are published by Canadian presses, and that's it. Um, and so I'm curious about the American distribution of them, and, and so I've got some classic Canadian pieces of literature and that you would literally, they're just intro to Canadian lit courses. Like these are works that are canonical Canadian lit works that need to be on there. Um, so if he has not read any of those, I'm going to be disappointed, I guess. But also it's encouraging for him because then I'm going to have a whole list of books for him to go and explore. But sadly, I think I'm not going to score very well because let's be honest, folks, we're all kind of keeping score on this. So the, the first one now, a few of these, I don't have a print edition. I've just got a digital copy. So I'm going to do my very best. And this is really going to test my digital skills, whether I can superimpose an image of the book somewhere on the screen, somewhere here. I don't know. We'll see if this works out or not. So the first one, though, it is a 2015 publication. It is called The Outside Circle. It is a graphic novel. This is a national bestseller in Canada. It's written by Patty Labucane Benson. Uh, she is a, a Métis woman, and the art is by Kelly Mellings. Now, the reason why I bring up her ethnicity is because this focuses very, very directly, like much of the, the lauded Canadian lit, it focuses very directly on um, First Nations issues. This is published by House of uh, Anansi Press. And the, the book has to do with generational trauma for this, uh, the, these two brothers who are both living in, I forget the, the city, but it's in the, somewhere in the prairies uh, in Canada. And they're, the older one is a gang member. He ends up going to prison and you see why, because their mother was a heroin addict and they were in foster care. And ultimately it shows generational poverty, generational violence, generational drug 
issues that you have within First Nations communities in Canada, um, and particularly for those who are living in large urban centers. And then showing how he starts getting in touch with his Aboriginal roots with his ancestry and he goes through a, a process of the the healing circle that they have in his particular tribe it's a really really well written graphic novel now i know that steve enjoys graphic novels and because this is um fairly literary um i don't particularly always like the distinction but this is a fairly literary graphic novel um and it's very popular i mean i know i know for a fact that it's taught across Canada in high schools. Um, I, I mean, it's kind of everywhere. So the outside circle, I'm curious about that one. Okay, the next one is also um, focusing in on First Nations issues. So this is Secret Path by Gord Downey and Jeff Lemire. So this is also a graphic novel. Uh, this was published in 2016. Now, if you're Canadian, I do not need to tell you who Gord Downey is. If you're not Canadian, you have no idea who I'm talking about, most likely. So Gord Downey was the lead singer of The Tragically Hip, a Canadian rock band. Now, and, and just one of the, the most acclaimed Canadian rock bands ever, right? Everybody in Canada knows Gord Downey. You do not go to the cottage without listening to the hip. You just don't. And of course, I've seen them in concert multiple times, like most good Canadians my age um, or older. Um, you know, they, they've been around for a while. And Gord Downey, he, uh, he sadly, he developed a brain tumor uh, several years ago. And then in the last year of his life, then he worked on this project. It's essentially the last artistic endeavor that he pursued. And the graphic novel it's actually a, a multimedia project that he did so it was an album and um a, a tour that he did with this and then also a graphic novel and what he did was he took the story of a young boy who grew up in a residential school in canada first nations boy who runs away and ends up dying now for for those of you who are unfamiliar, the residential school system in Canada is one of the darkest chapters in Canadian history. And what happened was the Canadian government, starting around Confederation, and believe me, I'm not an expert on this, okay? So I, I might get some of the details a little off, but around Confederation, when Canada officially became its own nation, so in 1876, um, sorry, in 1867, then what happened was the, the government developed this program to take Indian children away from their tribes, put them into these residential schools hundreds of miles from their parents, and to the official um, statement, and the one that gets quoted, is to kill the Indian and the child, to deny them their history, their belief system, their language, and to Anglican anglicize them to force english on them christian values it was run by the the church um, so the church administered these schools and the government took the children and put them in there approximately 30 percent of first nations children were removed from their parents and they were allowed to return once they reached um you know uh, adult age and um the level of abuse in these schools was staggering staggering there, the estimates are somewhere around 3,000, 6,000 children died in these schools, plus the level of psychological, sexual abuse, everything else that you can possibly imagine that was going on. And so something like three to 6,000 out of 150,000. It's an awful, awful chapter in Canadian history. The last residential school closed in 1996. <laughs> 1996. So, yeah. Um, so this is why I think they're important books, both The Outside Circle and Secret Path. They're both important books in Canadian literature, and they're graphic novels. They're accessible. Um, they, they give the message that, and not really, they're not message books necessarily, but they tell important stories and stories that should be told that um, as Canada moves towards reconciliation with its First Nations people, these are things that we need to consider um, looking back on the history and because it's still fairly recent history. Okay, the next one. Now, this is the one that I feel very confident that I'm going to be okay on, that he has not read this one. Okay, 
this is a book that my parents had in their collection and I was just such a curious reader when I was younger and I, I remained that way that I just picked up any book I possibly could that I could find anywhere and I found this on their shelf. It is called Gay Dogs and Dark Horses and it is written by Illingworth H. Kerr. So these are a collection of short stories that he wrote focusing in on Saskatchewan. So um, this was first published in 1946, um, printed in Canada by the Hugh Heaton Printing House Limited. So I read this when I was a kid a couple times. I remember one of the stories in this because it's been a while since I've read it. But one of the stories that I read in this was the, the, the short story of the KKK coming to the prairies in Canada. And as a kid and, and like looking into it and getting into the history of it. And then once I ended up becoming a high school teacher in Ontario, then looking into the history of that going, oh my goodness, this really happened. Like these are all these things. Like we've got certain um, mythologies and narratives that, that we like to put forth as Canadians about what a good, peaceful, wonderful country where nothing awful has ever happened. Like just how great Canada is. And kind of once you really start getting into it, then you go, mm-hmm. Yeah, like just peek a little bit under the mat and you go, there, there's some darkness there too, right? <laughs> and so um, in any case, uh, but they're mostly humorous stories, mostly. And um, I don't know anybody else who's read this. So I'm curious if he has. Um, the, the little bit of research that I've done says that Illingworth Kerr, the author of this, was mostly a painter who tried to paint the prairies. And as he put it, that he, he failed, like most people, that it is very difficult to really capture the beauty of the prairies. But in any case, it's um, I've, I've really enjoyed it. And I'm hoping that I can find somebody else who's read this who can maybe tell me more about it. Because I don't I honestly don't think that the book belonged to my parents. I think it belonged to one of my grandparents. And um, so... In any case, if somebody can help me out with that, that'd be great. The next one. Okay, come on. Steve, if you have not read Stephen Leacock, <laughs> I don't know what to do with you. And this is like, this is a gimme, right? So this is Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town. This was first published in 1912. Stephen Leacock is one of the great Canadian humorists. Um, you know, you could kind of consider him, and I don't really like doing this, right? Canadians can stand on their own you know, um, accomplishments, but kind of think of him more like a, a Mark Twain type of figure, right? So, um, and maybe, maybe Steve will make fun of me for that, but I, I'm just, I'm trying folks. I'm trying to, to <laughs> give you a point of access to this. So, uh, Stephen Leacock is a, an incredibly funny writer, an incredibly funny writer. And this is also a collection of short stories about small town Ontario and Ontario is the province where I grew up. Um, so they're fun, humorous stories set in his fictional town of Mariposa, uh, Mariposa Ontario. Um, Stephen Leacock is, is one of the, the best known Canadian writers. I mean, just down the, the street from me where I grew up in Toronto, then there was Stephen Leacock Park and Stephen Leacock High School. And um, I've got great memories of going there as a kid. And uh, yeah, so in any case, I'm sure you've read Stephen Leacock and you must have read Sunshine Sketches of a Little Town. If not, enjoy, because it's great. All right, the, the next one, I don't have a print edition of this, but I'm also going to, this is another gimme. All right, Farley Mowat. Farley Mowat, who has sold something like 17 million books, uh, you know, a Canadian writer from Belleville, Ontario. Um, he, he wrote mostly about the wilderness of Canada, the First Nations people going up north, um, and um, and about a lot of environmental issues, and so an incredibly popular writer. And I just wanted to, to read the the plot summary for this, just a short little one, because it's a it's a young adult, or really it's a children's book. Uh, first published in 1956, it won the Governor General's Award in 1956, which is a National Literary Prize in Canada. And I remember reading this at the appropriate age. I was probably I don't know nine or something like that nine or ten maybe i don't even know if i was that old when i first read it but um i've got fond memories of this book from from being a kid so it's um lost in the barrens or it's sometimes titled two against the north 
It's an adventure story that takes place in northern Manitoba and southwestern Northwest Territories in 1935. It tells of a coming-of-age tale of two boys in their late teens, one a white boy who has recently lost his parents, the other a Cree boy from a tribe living, living nearby. The boys embark on a mission to relieve the starvation of a neighboring village occupied by the Chippewas, but due to a series of unfortunate events become trapped above the tree line in Canada's northern barren lands during winter. The characters emerge again in Moet's The Curse of the Viking Grave, um, which I had read that as well. So um, there's obviously a number of Farley Moet books, and because uh, he was a prolific writer, and I'm sure, that, Steve, you've read a bunch of them. I'm sure, surely, especially because a lot of them are nonfiction, right? So um, I figure that you've read this, and so I'm curious about that one, but yeah, when I read that as a kid, that really captivated my imagination as a, a very adventurous young white boy growing up in the, the city of Toronto, in this massive city, um, dreaming about the North, dreaming about meeting some, you know, um, kid my age who's, you know, Cree, and we would go on these adventures together up North. It just captured my imagination. And later on in life, when I was a teenager, I did, in fact, go out to Alberta, which is, um, and, and fairly North in Alberta. I met a Cree boy who was my age, and we went fishing together, but it was basically two 15-year-olds, you know, making silly jokes and whatnot. It wasn't really this adventure that I had when I was a kid, but it did capture my imagination. I did, to some degree, try to pursue that as I got older. Uh, all right, so that's Farley Mowat. The next one is As For Me and My House uh, by Sinclair Ross. I'm going to read the, the back cover copy of this because I think that's probably the best way to describe it. It's from 1941, and it says, The town is Horizon, the setting of Sinclair Ross's brilliant classic study of life in the Depression era, hailed by critics as one of Canada's great novels, As For Me and My House, takes the form of a journal. The unnamed diarist, one of the most complex and arresting characters in contemporary fiction, explores the bittersweet nature of human relationships, of the unspoken bonds that tie people together, and the undercurrents of feeling that often tear them apart. Her chronicle creates an intense atmosphere, rich with observed detail and natural imagery. As for Me and My House is a landmark work. It is essential reading for anyone who seeks to understand the scope and power of the Canadian novel. So, for anyone who seeks to see the scope and power of the Canadian novel, there you go, they already told you what to look for. Read this one. Um, I don't think I can make a better endorsement other than that. So I read this in um, university in Canadian Lit. To be perfectly honest, I have not read it since. Like I say, it was not my best course. This is not my field. So these are pretty canonical books and I, I, in Canadian Lit. So I've got to think that that's another gimme, but we'll see. Okay. The next one, and I, I, I really was unsure what to, to do with this, but the next one, Monica Hughes. Okay, Monica Hughes' Invitation to the Game. This was first published in 1992. You cannot find a Canadian kid my age with, within, I would say, probably five years above and easily 10, 15 years below me who has not read this book. Um, it is a dystopian young adult novel. Uh, I'm not sure if I said it already. It was uh, published in 1992. Monica Hughes was uh, a great writer, born in England, but spent most of her time in Canada. And um, I don't know how well read she is in her works are in the United States. I genuinely don't know. So a lot of this stuff is puzzling because there's some stuff that you just grow up with as a Canadian kid and you just assume everybody's read this. And then you realize, oh, that was Canadian. I didn't even realize this like this it's just it's sci-fi dystopian set about 150 years in the future and um, Monica Hughes she's written a, a number of books that are dystopian focusing in on that theme like I say every Canadian kid within my age knows this book and every Canadian kid who reads who, who read a fair bit uh, growing up and this is one of the ones that you know I know has been taught in middle school and, and things like that but you'll see it in every school library so come on come on right uh, all right, the the next one, so I've got two, the next two pair pretty well together. So we have a series of lectures in Canada called the Massey Lectures. And so what they are is it's a series of lectures, I believe they're, they're five parts, and the 
book, the Massey Lectures, with essentially the, the script that the presenter reads is published at the same time as the, le as the lectures are going on. And they're just supposed to raise um, overall public discussion on important issues from important intellectuals and thinkers. So most often it's Canadian intellectuals who present at these, not always. So Northrop Fry, for instance, the literary critic um, who is a professor at the University of Toronto. And notice I did not choose a Northrop Fry book because I figured that's a gimme for sure with Steve Donahue. Am I right? I'm sure I am. Um, I did not choose Northrop Fry. I also didn't choose any Atwood or Monroe or Margaret Lawrence, right? Um, I didn't I didn't choose any of those. But um, the the Massey lectures are are really fun. They're accessible lectures on fascinating topics by experts in their field. So the the first one that I have is written by Thomas King. So Thomas King has a, a great writer of fiction. And he mostly focuses in on Aboriginal stories and Aboriginal themes in Canadian lit. And so this is The Truth About Stories, a native narrative, and it is really excellent. I've taught this in um, Ontario high schools, um, at least sections from it, and Thomas King gets taught all the time in, in Canadian schools. So it's really interesting because it focuses in on the way what First Nations storytelling does, particular approaches to narrative, how the story itself changes because they're oral narratives historically, then we're talking about an oral culture. And so how the stories change from one telling to the other, but they're all canonical. Doesn't matter if it's different from one to the next. It's that happened, but that happened too, and that happened too. And it doesn't matter if there's contradictions and details or there's omissions. They're all the story right and it's really fascinating hearing it's it's essentially it's aboriginal literary theory right it's just a, it's a literary theory about aboriginal oral storytelling and with a particular focus on canadian uh tribes so um i'm hoping that you've read that and if not it's a treat it really is the next one I'm sure that you know Adam Gopnik, who is, he's been a writer at The New Yorker for 25 years. Um, he's kind of moved around. I believe he was born in the U.S., but then lived in Canada in Montreal for a good deal of his life and went to McGill University and then um, has been writing for The New Yorker for quite a while. So this was published, this is another um, Massey lecture presented by um, CBC Sponsors Them, which is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. So he published this in 2011. 11 and it is winter five windows on the season now a, a little bit of my history with this my mother-in-law when she was um still alive she she was a big reader um a very very uh big reader and she was a librarian as well and so we would talk all the time right this is just before just as i started getting my stuff published um like it was just before she passed away and you know it was exciting like when i got an agent and you know when i started getting short stories published and her being a, a very big reader and a librarian it was it was nice to be able to have those conversations and so we would talk about books all the time and i remember her talking to me about this book and encouraging me to read it and i was not interested because for one thing i as like many canadians but prob but more than most I really struggled with winter, really, really struggled with winter. Um, it affected me in profound ways, um, much more so than for a lot of people, which is one of the reasons why I have moved south, because it was just not healthy for me. I did not respond well to it my entire life, and it was continuing to get worse. So when she told me about this book and these reflections that Gopnik was making about winter and the importance of it on the Canadian identity and how that has shaped over time and not just the Canadian identity but the European conception of winter the American conception of winter and what these northern communities how we've conceived of it historically how we've idealized portions of it how we have vilified portions of it it's really really fascinating and I remember her telling me about it and all that I could think at the time was 
I don't want to read about winter. <laughs> I want to read about warm places. I want to read about being, you know, in the, the Mediterranean or somewhere in the Caribbean or something like that, especially because like it was winter at the time when we were talking about this. She said, no, 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 I know that you don't, you don't want to hear more about winter, but it's carefully considered and it's thoughtful and it's, it's profound at times. It's, it's really good. And I, I just, I wasn't really interested. And after she passed away, I salvaged this from the house when we were cleaning out the, the family house and not with a little bit of guilt. Then I looked at it and I went, no one else knows about this book in the family. She didn't tell that to anybody else. And it's kind of on me. And I, I didn't want, I, I wasn't sure about reading it, but I didn't want to see it just get donated somewhere. So I, I, I took it and then a while later, in my farmhouse in Ontario with a wood stove going in the coldest months of the year, I read it. I read it in the right setting at the right time. And she was right. And it was really tough because I couldn't talk to her about it. And I couldn't tell her that she was right. And how much of a good recommendation it was, especially for somebody who at times struggles with winter. Right? For people who love it and people who don't. It's a really, really good consideration about the season. So um, if you have not read that, then I really do encourage you to read it. Okay, the last one. I'm totally cheating. This is a gimme on it. So Orphans of Liberty by Nathan Knapp. Now, um, in case you don't know, this is my book. And Steve has reviewed this. Um, he's not only read it. He has reviewed it on his channel, and it was a very fair review. Very fair. In fact, um, it it uh, was pretty powerful for me to see him read my book and talk about it. And more than anything else, he got it. He understood what it was about. Because several people have not understood what I was trying to do. They didn't understand what it is exactly that I was trying to say. And it was kind of staggering. It's kind of a strange feeling being an author and going, how are people not getting what I was doing? <laughs> how are they just not getting it? It feels like it was overt. And not only did he read it um, in a single night, he understood everything that I was trying to achieve, which was great. Um, it was encouraging for me. And so while this might seem while this might seem like shameless self-promotion, if you know anything about me, you know that nothing I do is shameless. I am constantly racked with shame about every single action I take all the time. I just live in a pit of shame constantly. So believe me, I'm completely ashamed that I'm promoting this, and yet I'm doing it anyway. All right, so those are my 10. 10 books. How did I do? I hope that I did pretty well, but honestly, even if I didn't, even if I didn't, these are all really good books that everyone would benefit from reading. And I'm curious, how well are these traveling across that, that border, right? Into the United States um, and elsewhere in the world. How well is Canadian lit traveling? Please let me know, because I'm genuinely curious. All right, thanks so much for watching. I'll talk to you next time.